start. Uh, thank you all for coming here today. I'm Emilio Parrado, professor of sociology, and I'm co-organizing with uh, Tulia Faletti this annual theme for the uh, DCC program that Roger directs on the post-neoliberal Latin America. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce today to you David Smiley, uh, who's the Charles and Fabro, Fabro Charles and Leo Faber, Professor of Human Relations in the Department of Sociology at Tulane University. Uh, David received his PhD in Sociology from the University of Chicago, and we had a chance to study together. Uh, he's a specialist in Latin American politics, social movements, and religious identifications, especially in the case of Venezuela. He's the author of Reason to Believe, Cultural Agency in Latin American Evangelicalism, that won the Distinguished Book Award from the Section of Sociology of Religion from the American Sociological Association. And he has published extensively on issues of political participation and, uh, and religion in Latin America. He's currently the editor of Qualitative Sociology. Uh, more recently, he has edited the volume on Venezuelan Bolivarian Democracy, Participation, Politics, and Culture in Venezuela. Uh, David actually splits his life between Venezuela and the U.S., so he's perfect to talk to us about what's going on really in Venezuela. Um, he runs a blog for the Washington Office of, La of Latin America on Venezuelan politics and human rights. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have him here today to talk about uh, 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 Venezuelan politics and to discuss his paper entitled From Partial to Full Conflict Theory a neo bavarian perspective on post-neoliberal Venezuela. And uh, it's also a pleasure for us to have uh, Randy, Randall Collins, discuss uh, Dave's paper. Uh, Randy is the Dorothy Swain Thomas Professor of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Randy is a highly accomplished sociologist, perhaps you know, arguably one of the most uh, important sociologists of our time. Uh, he has received many awards and recognitions, and the list is too long to, to mention them here. He's the former president of the American Sociological Association, and it's actually a pleasure to have him as a colleague in the department. Uh, he has published and edited, I counted uh, at least 16 books, including a classic one in sociology, which is entitled Three Sociological Traditions, which has been translated to several languages and actually read in Spanish. Uh, he's currently working on a new book project entitled Time Dynamics of Conflict, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him here today to discuss uh, Dave's paper. Uh, so, uh, the format today, uh, you all have access to the, to the paper, so uh, Dave is going to briefly summarize the main arguments from uh, 15 to 10, 15 minutes, and uh, Randy is going to give us his comments, and then we're going to open the floor uh, to really discuss the paper. So, thank you. You can sit here, or we prefer to be standing. I have a little stand by. Okay. Well, it's it's a really uh, a pleasure to be here at the University of Pennsylvania again. I, I appreciate the invitation of Emilio and Rogers. And then really an honor to have Randy Collins uh, uh, speaking or uh, uh, starting to discuss on my papers. I, I, I've taught Randy's book, Four Sociological Traditions, now for about 13 years. And I told my students just the other day, on Tuesday, I mentioned to them that I, I had this book when I was a theory student, an undergraduate, but when I had it, it was called Three Sociological Traditions. And then everybody laughed. I feel old. Um, okay. <laughs> the um, okay. So uh, what I was told for that this is uh, going to be a workshop discussion, and so uh, to just give an introduction that gives the context uh, of the paper and, and sort of what what this paper is, what project this paper is a part of, and what I'm trying to do with this. And, and to do that, I'd just like to briefly. Uh, uh, explain how this comes out of, out of my my sort of intellectual biography, which is is is, is sort of unusual, uh, at least in its endpoint. The um, I'm originally an ethnographer of religion. I went to Venezuela originally to do ethnography of religion. As Emilio mentioned, my first book was on evangelical conversion. Um, 
I, it just happened that my first, uh, my, my trip to Venezuela was planned precisely when Hugo Chavez threw his first coup in 1992. My trip was between the two coups that year. Um, so my, my whole trajectory in studying Venezuela, doing empirical research, was always parallel to the rise of Hugo Chavez. Um, now, I, I, I was really doing ethnography, hanging out with people and trying to understand religious conversion, trying to understand people and how they use culture to gain agency in their lives. But I've always, from the beginning, given the context, have, have participated in discussion groups on Venezuelan politics. You know, so much, so much of what you see on uh, Venezuelan politics is very abstract, broad brush strokes, uh, treatments of what is going on there. And if you're there doing field work, inevitably, it's, you sort of bristle at the portrayals of Venezuela and you want to say something. So I participated right from the very beginning. Even though I was a, a, a fan of a religion, I participated in discussions on, on politics. Now, when I finished my first book, my, my ethnography of religion, um, at that point, <clears throat> or Jeff Goodwin asked me to write something on Venezuela as well for context. He said, you know, I talked to him about it and discussed it with him. And he said, why don't you write a piece, you know, just, it, just trying to lay out what's going on from a sociology perspective in Venezuela. So I wrote a piece called The Social Structure of Hugo Chavez, you know, it, which, which was the first time I'd written something that actually was not about religion. Uh, I had written an academic piece. The, uh, that led to uh, a, a lot, lots of session that was on participation. It led to a couple of different um, uh, uh, presentations here and there. I started to develop this sort of parallel career in which I started to do consulting and presentations at places like the Wilson Center in, in Washington, D.C. for policymakers and journalists. The, um, and so by 2008, I in fact started to do consulting on the side. I started to do uh, uh, work for foundations and NGOs, writing country reports, writing analyses of issues such as human rights and global context. And I started working with, by 2011, I started working with an NGO called the Washington Office on Latin America. Uh, they really wanted to, to uh, do some more work on Venezuela, and, and I was looking for institutional support for this kind of consulting that I was doing. Uh, by, by that time, I had, you know, years of sort of these reports that I had written on the side, and I decided to bring these together in a book, in a book that was going to be um, uh, oriented towards uh, policymakers and journalists, not really necessarily scholars, although I always thought, you know, they have a scholarly audience as well, but really the goal of the book was to try and provide expert analysis for non-experts, for people, for this, these many policymakers and journalists that want to understand what's going on in Venezuela, but, but find it elusive. And, you know, just looking at the media and even looking at a lot of scholarship is so polarized uh, of what, what's going on that it, it can be very difficult unless you really want to spend a lot of time on it. So, um, so I put together this book project. I had this book manuscript uh, together. Um, in 2010, I had an editor interested in it. I was putting together this manuscript, and I was presenting different aspects of it here and there. And I would frequently get, <clears throat> get pushback from people, quite logical, saying, well, what is your perspective? You know, what is your political perspective that you're coming from? Because I, I always try to present myself as nonpartisan, as independent. And it's really hard to do that in a Venezuelan context because people always want to say, well, you're either an opposition person, you know, that's, that's just pretending to be neutral, but you're really against the government, or you're actually, you know, some sort of government operative being paid under the table, and you're just trying to present yourself as objective. Well, it, it, so I, I got a lot of pushback from that. And so I decided, well, I have to write an appendix to this book that lays out my perspective, because of course I do have a political perspective. It's just not a partisan perspective. It's not a perspective that lines up very easily with the Venezuelan political spectrum. It's a perspective that's basically it's based on human rights and, and social justice. The, uh, so digging deep and, and thinking what kind of appendix I could write, you know, the, the, my Weberian training uh, came, came to the fore, and you know, I, I wrote something that was basically that was based on this idea of class status and, and party, you know, and, and also influenced by uh, having taught Randy's book many years and, and the, the emphasis of, that Randy puts on monopolization as a key element in, in Baker's theory of stratification. Um, working, we can talk a little bit further, uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about the issue of causality, multi-causality and conjunctural causality. I really highlighted that there as well. 
Pushing further, I came across the work of Michael Mann, and I think you know, that's the most interesting sort of contemporary attempt to come up with a real multi, multi-causal model uh, of, um, of, of social conflict. The, but in any case, so this is originally a theoretical appendix for a book that is destined for, that is aimed at journalists and policymakers. Now, the whole idea of this book was to help people understand Chavez and Chavismo. Now, of course, uh, the book took longer than I thought. By 2012, Chavez had had his second recurrence of cancer. It was very clear that he was not long for this world. Um, he had a second recurrence of cancer within one year. It, things do not look good. And really, since then, things have just never stopped in Venezuela. And I, I've had very little time to work on the book. Now, the book doesn't really seem to even make sense anymore. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we, we don't know, even know how long Chavismo is going to be around anymore. You know? At first I thought, well, I can, write, I can still write it and it'll be helpful to understand Maduro. Now the government is so unstable, it's not clear how long, you know, the current situation is going to last. And so I have to, you know, uh, one of the things I'm doing is rethinking this manuscript. And one of the things I'm doing by writing this paper as part of this initiative is I'm going to use this paper, use this process of writing this paper to rethink what I want to do with this manuscript. And what I'm thinking is, is, to, is to write a book on Venezuela in the Chavez period that would look something like uh, Michael Mann's books, uh, um, you know, won't be four volumes, but uh, um, you know, the, the type of uh, episodic history that he writes. Um, the, uh, I, I, I mentioned to Rogers that uh, I would, uh, I mentioned in passing that I, I would go through some of the tension points that um, that I see in the, in the manuscript or in, in, in this manuscript and that that need to be pushed on. Uh, and, and Roger jumped on and said, "Yeah, focus on that." And then I thought about it. And I like, you know, you guys have all worked so hard reading this 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 paper and showing up here, and I'm going to take away from you the joy of finding weak spots in my manuscript. <laughs> I, I can't do that to you, so I'm just going to set that aside. Yeah, I'm sure, but I promise, if, it, if any of them don't come up, I will mention it. Um, what I will say is what, what, the, uh, what my goals are, just to kind of recapitulate my goals for this manuscript. The, I mean, the, the basic, the first uh, most basic idea is I want to get beyond the exclusive focus on the government. You know? Just that it, most analyses basically look at Chavismo by looking at uh, Chavez, the government, which seems pretty logical. But I think, especially in sociology, there's been a long-term critique of sort of uh, pluralist political science, at least in its Dalian version, um, from the likes of Stephen Luke's, and uh, I really, it, it goes before that already, uh, there, were, there were critique before Luke's, that, that argues, that, you know, that says that there's this exclusive focus on constituted power and not uh, no real way of understanding what, who's not at the table and why they're not at the table. And so uh, that's a sort of classic sociological critique that I think orients what I'm trying to do. Um, more concretely, uh, I think uh, I want to portray what's going on in Venezuela as a conflict, not as a government, as a conflict. It, it, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a constellation that's in power and there's a constellation that's fighting against it. And so it's a conflict. If you don't portray it as, as a conflict, as a relational uh, um, uh, uh, conflict, it, I think you're missing something. And secondly, uh, I, don't, I want to portray it not just as political, but as something that's also economic, social, cultural, uh, military. Uh, it's, it's a multifaceted conflict that goes far beyond just um, uh, the government and its opposition. Uh, thirdly, I, I want to build into the analysis right from the beginning, I think Michael Mann does this exceptionally well, it, it's extra national character, you know, it, uh, on both sides, Chavismo, one of its, one of its, its, uh, uh, its uh, most salient characteristics is the way it's internationalized its networks, the way it has, it has developed allies, the way it has sort of financed social movements in other places, the way it benefits from solidarity groups, and the opposition, I think, probably even more, even more international. People in the opposition themselves have more international networks, and the role of expatriates, I think, is very important in this conflict. So I want, I want to have a methodology that, um, uh, or a perspective that will build that in right from the beginning. And finally, this is something new for me and kind of new for sociologists, 
is that uh, you know after after resisting for a long time uh, the fact that political science is normative or, or that was a normative critique I've actually come to appreciate that and and I, so I want to have a, a theory that has built in that can be used for normative critique of a, of a context and uh, you know I think. You know the type of stuff that Michael Mann does. There is a lot of uh, a lot of theory that I'm using here has been used in historical sociology, but generally historical sociology is is about early modern Europe, uh, is about context uh, of far away in time, and is not uh, really engaged in the uh, debates of our day. I mean, just just the other day, uh, there was a piece by Orlando Patterson that was circulating on social media. I don't remember what the actual outlet was, but he said how. It, how sociology made itself irrelevant, and basically was talking about this, about how sociologists have not sought to be uh, part of the great debates of our day. The, um, and so I, I don't think that it has to be that way. I think that, um, I think, uh, that especially what is going on in Latin America right now, the post-neoliberal context, all of the democratic innovation, the actual content, uh, uh, two things I were just talking about this morning, the actual content of the changes that are going on in terms of Latin American democracy provide a huge opportunity for specifically sociological analysis uh, and for sociologists to have some say in, 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 in what's going on. Um, uh, one last comment. Um, you know, I, 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 the, the title of, of the paper is sort of grandiose, sort of self serving from partial to full conflict theory. Uh, I realize that. But that's, that's kind of the purpose. I, I, I sort of want it to be, I want it to provoke. I want it to bother people. I want other scholars to have to explain why their, why their perspectives, why their popular perspectives are not partial. You know? So that, that's on purpose. Uh, I try to provoke with that. Um, I'll leave it there. And, uh, Concise, I was expecting a, a full rendition of the main points of the paper. Okay. Well, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, as uh, David made clear, uh, Michael Mann's uh, uh, four dimensional uh, theory of the sources of social power is really an expansion of Weber. So, um, you know, class states party, let's you know, call, call them uh, economic um, uh, econ economic, cultural, uh, and then the, the third one, which is essentially uh, political power, man splits that into political institutions per se and the military. Um, the, he took uh, yeah, a long, long time longer than David actually had to do his you know, four volume work. The first volume was uh, 1986, the uh, second one was in 93, and then the last two, two volumes uh, came out very recently, although he kind of got sidetracked a bit. The, the, the first volume essentially uh, went up to the French Revolution, the second volume got to the, the First World War. And then he got into the 20th century. He wrote this brilliant book about fascists. I mean, fascists in many different kind of countries. And then another book called The Dark Side of Democracy. It's, it was supposed to be a chapter about ethnic cleansing. And it is, I think, the most powerful analysis I've ever seen of exactly what's in the title of it, you know, the, the negative effects of shifting towards uh, uh, democracy. It's, uh, uh, at, at any rate, um, man is essentially a, a, a Weberian, um, and for the most part, his theory is used as a histoire raisonnée. I mean, that is, we have these, these are our categories through which we can tell in a concise and analytical way what is happening in, in various uh, historical periods. And I think, indeed, that's exactly the way Weber thought he was uh, operating, that it was impossible to have a causal theory, but uh, uh, you could operate through the, these ideal type uh, uh, mechanisms to see, uh, in, a, uh, in a sense, the, the skeleton of history. The, the metaphor is too static. It means the bones are sort of moving, right? But what are, what are those bones as they, as they move?
mood. The very best uh, part of man uh, is generally considered to be the first uh, volume. Um, and there are two, uh, two reasons for that. Uh, one of them is um, he formulates uh, an important part of the theory about the rise of the modern state. <coughs> I'm not the one that do, does it. Uh, uh, Charles Tilley and, and others, it's often referred to as the military fiscal model of the modern state. You know, the, the, the growth of uh, large-scale uh, standing armies then uh, results in an elimination contest between uh, different states, essentially around their logistics, the extent to which they can uh, rationalize their taxation system and other sources of income. And once they've done that, they create bureaucracy and hence bureaucracy starts penetrating society. Chuck Tilley has this wonderful take on this. He's, he he attaches this to the rise of the social movement. He says you could have protests, you could have riots, but you can't have a social movement until you've actually got a target. If the government doesn't have a central uh, bureaucratic presence, there's really nothing you can aim at. You can kind of burn down the local you know, millers and, and, and so, so forth. But, uh, the, but so at any, any rate, it's, I mean, the spin-offs from, you know, essentially what historical sociologists and, and indeed historians and political scientists did around that, uh, the rise, rise of modern state, the rise of modern politics, I think, is one of the big triumphs of our discipline. Um, as we get later into <coughs> man's volumes, they become more uh, historians of day rather than a theory about what's you know, what's, what's, what's happened, although some of the chapters are, I mean, they're tremendously insightful. This chapter about the rise of the Japanese Empire is by far the best thing I've ever seen on this topic. It's a topic most people have paid much attention to. You know, kind of, uh, topic by topic, they're really good. Now, um, I'll just add one more point, which is actually most striking in the first volume. Man says, he doesn't just say there are four dimensions or four sources of power, he says there are four networks. He describes each of these as a network, and he means that in a fairly literal sense. I mean, that is, you know, the way you can actually do network analysis of who is connected to who, where the holes in the network, how far do they extend. And he dispenses with the concept of a society. He says we get into trouble with that. We, you know, we reify this thing, and uh, when uh, you know, the whole soci social science of <coughs> was in the era of the nation state, so it was very easy to talk about. The nation state as if it were this uh, unit. So is that uh, it takes the crystallization of all the networks essentially around the state, which tries to bound the territory to make uh, the, you know, all the all the networks look like they're you know, concentric. Throughout most of history, that's not the case. And so, for instance, he makes this. And so that's where the argument comes from. There is no prime mover. There is no particular one of these networks that always leads. And so there's a very Weberian part of it early on in the book where he says ideological power was the uh, you know, initial network which expanded out from these you know, very, very uh, small uh, states well beyond the boundary of the states themselves. So, but he's not, he's not saying it's like, oh, the power of Christianity spreads out, the power of Islam spreads out. The networks literally spread out. And then they have these effects like carrying uh, the emergent networks with them. And, and so forth. So, they, you know, the early part of the, the four volume series is, uh, you know, very uh, conceptually quite, uh, quite uh, brilliant. Uh, now, so when reading uh, uh, David's, <coughs> David's paper, um, uh, he, uh, you know, sums that all, all up with this very strong uh, point about there is no crime mover, you know, so that, you know, contrary to, say, Marx uh, uh, and uh, theory or uh, in another version, essentially, you know, pluralistic theory about the political sphere, pluralism in the political sphere is the <coughs> central one. Uh, so David wants to fill it out to uh, who are all the actors in all uh, four of those uh, dimensions in uh, Venezuela and then kind of set this thing in, in motion. Now, I um, you know, recently convinced with a man's long-term argument that the prime, that um, there isn't a prime mover throughout all periods in history. But he does argue that you can see in particular periods, uh, one of them will be, or uh, it's just sort of empirically that, that, that case that 
one of them can be the primary fluid that's pushing all the rest of them. And so I'm going to actually you know, pick a bit of a, a conceptual quarrel here with David about, about this because this is the way I read his paper. Now, um, I some people make diagrams out of things, you know, this one he focuses on. Hey, Dave kind of neatly lists the four quadrants, ideological, economic, military, political power, he does it for the dish, shall we on this side, here the opponents on, on uh, that side, and the paper is uh, most, most of it is dedicated to filling them in. All right, now, so are they all four equally important in his analysis? So I'm kind of throwing back to what uh, David uh, wrote, at least as I interpret it. Okay, so in the foreground is political, okay, so political power is the, is the dimension. You know, so uh, Chavez and, and uh, uh, Maduro uh, strengthen the control of the, of the state. Uh, start by seizing the uh, executive, getting uh, a majority in the legislature, and then uh, building on both of those, expanding into the judiciary, politicizing the military, uh, centralizing uh, the, the uh, state, by, uh, both by um, getting more state penetration into local areas and taking away local autonomy. Uh, and this leads to what re reinforces the uh, uh, David starts with the beginning of the uh, paper, too much focus on the political. Um, uh, but as well, there's a kind of a reason for the, that focus, and that is this is the realm where the strongest uh, criticism of the Shavismo uh, regime comes out. Now, so it's kind of a violation of human rights. Uh, now, interestingly enough, Okay, so we'd actually put the human rights up here in the, you know, way up the page in the ideological sector. But I don't really read this as seeing as like the ideological sector is, you know, really uh, causing the autonomousness. It seems to be kind of reacting to uh, the, uh, the political uh, sector. So kind of we're using it now here a, a, a bit. I mean, come back to that in a minute if you, if you like about the uh, independence of the ideological. Uh, okay. The other sector that seems to be so central in this is uh, actually the economic sector. And you say, well, what about the military? Well, yeah, so Chavez takes power through the military, but we read very little more about that. It's kind of like, okay, they stepped in. But the military kind of falls out after that point. They're not you know, particularly important. Uh, the, um, Uh, this is just kind of a, a, a footnote. You know, some of you know Miguel Centeno's uh, a book uh, called Blood and Power in Latin America. I'm not sure the title conveys quite what it's about. He says Latin America is a country that a part of the world didn't fight a lot of foreign wars. And foreign wars were the center of this Weberian dynamic in Europe. And so that the, you know, the monopoly of power and bureaucratization state, not state extraction capabilities doesn't happen there. The sink of our was made on Sub Saharan Africa. It's a place that didn't, wasn't allowed to go through the Bavarian dynamics of a bunch of these states. Well, uh, at, at any rate, uh, that's kind of a reason for, it kind of reinforces the point here that in, in a certain sense, this model is collapsing out of a two dimensional model in effect. It's the political one uh, and uh, then the economic one. And then I, I look into it. Uh, uh, well, okay, uh, just a very you know, quick summary of uh, what uh, David says. Uh, it says, okay, the key uh, feature of the uh, Venezuelan state is it's a, it's a petroleum state, a petroleum rich, rich state. Uh, yeah, hence, it seizes control of, uh, the, of the uh, petroleum industry. It, uh, it expands its uh, capacity into other economic sectors, uh, uses it to promote social well-being, this leads into high legitimacy. So it's kind of like, okay, calls an area, calls an arrow running over from the economic sphere into the uh, political sphere. Uh, but uh, now we get uh, dynamic. It reminds me a bit of Marx, actually. Uh, the economic sphere, and you can, uh, one reason why the economic sphere is so important in Marx is because he's theorized it. It's got a driving dynamic to it. You know, for, and the other spheres don't really have their own dynamic. I mean, they, they exist, but 
uh, the, the sphere which does have a diameter tends to push the others. Okay, so now uh, you know the list of you know, various things that could uh, can happen um, uh, since the uh, oil income is being uh, spent on social well-being, it's not being put into investment and hence falling production. Uh, other problems, uh, falling world oil prices, falling revenue, hence falling services, hence electric blackouts, water outages, uh, loss of legitimacy, um, state control of foreign exchange, a way of fighting back against you know, international finance and capitalism, leads to a black market, leads to drain on government reserves, uh, etc. Et uh, and there's a bit of a tone in, in, in here, I don't know how far David wants to you know, push this, but about, uh, yeah, keep on going, it will lead to an economic collapse. And given the model that he's set up uh, here, uh, that the economic sector seems to be the really you know, dynamic key to this economic collapse, then it presumably will lead to the uh, revolution. Uh, in an odd way, this the argument actually underlying our argument uh, resembles Marxism, but it's sort of like Marxism, you know, entirely from the point of view of uh, neoliberal finance capitalism. You know, like, uh, this, that is the dynamic that the liberals think that you go against, you go against uh, their their rules, uh, you're gonna you're gonna lose. Um, the, now. Uh, just a little bit uh, here about um, revolution, and then a few words at the end about uh, the uh, ideological sphere. Um, so, uh, is re revolution possible? Well, uh, one of the things I think has been kind of a, a, a big achievement of you know the year since the Scotch Bowl brought up here, the states and social revolutions, uh, is. Uh, the you know, development of uh, what you can refer to as the state breakdown theory of revolution, uh, you know, not nicely enunciated in uh, Jack Goldstone, but uh, there are elements of it in, in uh, uh, man as, as well. So it's an argument that essentially says um, revolts from the from below revolts result from immiseration uh, are, are almost never successful. Uh, what uh, starts off major revolutions is always a crisis of the state and above all a, um, uh, a resource crisis of the state, a fiscal crisis of the, of the state. Uh, and then in conjunction with that, the key point that splits the state elites who will uh, uh, fight each other into a deadlock and thereby uh, uh, eliminate the repressive uh, uh, power of the state. Popular uprisings are the third factor here, but they are, can only be successful in the context of uh, the first two. Uh, now, is this uh, likely to happen in Venezuela? You know, actually, you know, reading the last part of Dave's paper, I was thinking, mm -hmm. you know, considering, he, he makes an argument from opinion polls that uh, they're about 30% you know, kind of ideological diehards on both sides, and the other forty uh, percent are just a swing vote depending on government performance. And that now, that the fact that uh, the forty percent could get un unhappy doesn't mean you have a revolution. Uh, but so the, the key factor would seem to be: um, would can we imagine circumstances in, in which this the Venezuelan state really would get a full-scale fiscal crisis and uh, are things you know, kind of labeling there so that it could actually split into competing elites at the top that would paralyze each other. Uh, I want to add one last, last point here at the, at the end about uh, this. Um, since the late 90s, there's been the uh, popularity of a different model of, of revolution. I mean, you can think of this as the color revolutions model. Uh, that you know, and indeed, there are uh, people who you know go in, around the world trying to sort of train people how to carry out a how to realize a revolution. And essentially, it's a tipping point mechanism. It kind of harkens back to uh, Thomas Schelling's model of conflict quite some uh, years ago. 
that uh, uh, if uh, a sufficient number of people get uh, mobilized in a central place, you know, where they're, you know, in effect, putting uh, sort of uh, maximal, uh, not so much threat, but sort of a, kind of a, a Durkheimian emotional pressure on uh, people in, in that central place. Think Tower Square, think, uh, you know, think Paris, you know, 1789, or quite a few other, other uh, years. Uh, think uh, <coughs> Petersburg in 1917. Um, the government uh, <coughs> may simply flip over. Uh, that is, they you know, cave into that, uh, cave into that pressure. And from this, you know, comes the uh, this very idealistic uh, theme about color revolutions. That if you get, you know, this kind of you know, massive display of the people in solidarity, you don't actually have to have a bloody revolution. They will flip over. Okay, that the uh, you know the 17th day of Tower Square was taken as a great confirmation of that. You know, on the other hand. I mean, there are many counterexamples, and one of the nastiest ones is Syria. And I just want to you know, point out you know, two uh, really crucial features. This this model depends on having a central place. Uh, if it's if there were uh, if uh, the the revolts take place in a decentralized fashion, uh, it really inhibits the possibility of having this kind of. You know, Quick tipping point mechanism is likely to lead to bloody civil war. Um, the the other uh, feature of it is um, it's not just a slogan of saying you know, we are the people or the people and the army are one. Uh, that has to seem like a kind of a real psychological fact for the people on the ground. And at that point, there's pretty strong pressure for the army to to flip over. If there are counter demonstrators, or the demonstrators are split, palpably split, this mechanism doesn't work. Instead, what you get is pretty vicious kind of situations. It's like Germany in the 1920s. It's uh, Syria again. again. The, and you know, it's kind of in that sense. All right, so it's now I, I, there are two, two connected points that uh, I'll say in conclusion here. Um, I said that uh, Venezuela may be working itself up into the direction of a kind of a genuine revolutionary situation, not a tipping point one. Remember, the tipping point one doesn't, you can kind of do it at any time if they can get the crowds together for you know, whatever uh, reason. It doesn't depend on a government crisis. You know, whereas the crisis mechanism of the government is kind of generally strapped for cash and they can't agree on how to, how to get it, then uh, they can't get that. They can't escape that. You know, it's it's, it's a real uh, structural dilemma that people are caught, are caught up in. Uh, the uh, Venezuela may be heading on on that on that path, but short of, of that, um, it doesn't look like anything like a tipping point mechanism is possible in, in Venezuela. It's true they have a central place, but you know this massive split inside the population just seems to make that uh, impossible. And it, it makes me worry that if the Venezuelan did government did break down, you're not heading towards you know kind of easy transition to democracy. You're heading toward, towards a fairly vicious civil war. Okay, I'll hand it back to you. Dave, to okay. the front, so you, you can answer. So, should I I'll first uh, address some of the questions or comments, and then we can open it up? The, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's important to me, but unfortunately, you just said that. The thing is, I live in Venezuela most of the year, and, and that is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Is there any easy way, easy transition out of the, the current uh, uh, equilibrium? The, um, because indeed, one of the things I was, one of the things I wanted to do in this in this exercise is, um, you know, uh, is, is point out through this analysis just how strong of a hand Chavismo has. You know? 
if you just if you look at table one, you look at table two, both of them, you can see that stack, the, the deck is stacked. And is that they have they have the state, they have the economy, they have the military, you know, and they also have a robust ideology. Whereas the opposition, uh, you know, what they have basically is just by default the fact that the government doesn't have a, 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 a workable model of governance. And so, but the thing is, within Venezuela, many in the opposition still think, or have thought for a long time, they really think they have the upper hand. They think that they are strong. And I know, you know, I live in Caracas, and it's so sort of segmented geographically, the sort of Caracas by class, that it's very easy for anybody who identifies with opposition to never have to talk to anybody who identifies with Chavismo, especially in conditions of equality. Of course, the, you know, the waiter who, who serves them the food, the person that cleans their house, the person that fixes their car, might be Chavista, but they never talk to them in terms of, of equality. So many, many of my neighbors in Caracas, they all think they have, they're in a really strong hand, that they're in, in the driver's seat, and, you know, and I think it's just, it's crazy. You know, and so in fact, in 2014, starting in, Fe in February, really from February to through April, there was massive street protests, and it was this kind of color revolution. And many people thought that the government was going <coughs> to fall, that they were going to get the government out. And the government was able to wait them out. The government was able to, to call out, uh, you know, the National Guard and put down the protests and jail students and, and do all kinds of things. And, they, you know, and they, they did it relatively easily. And uh, one of the things that I, I want is to be able to map and show just, just how difficult this is. I, and I agree, it's very worrying because I don't think that there's a real tipping point mechanism is going is to be able to happen. And you know, and the, the, the most recent poll just from this week shows that Maduro, President Nicolas Maduro's support is now below 25%. You know, Chavez never go up below 30%. You know, back in, in 2003, he got down about 31%. The, um, you know, which is, you know, there's a legislative election in 2015, and there's a possibility of a recall referendum in 2016. And it's not clear to me that they will necessarily, you know, uh, they've, they've, they've lost elections before, and they've honored those, but they've never really lost power since Chavez won in 1998. So, um, yeah, I, I think it, it looks kind of ominous. You know? um, going back to your your first comments, which were, uh, I think, uh, quite provocative, the, uh, about whether this whether this actually collapses down into uh, a two-dimensional model, which is basically economic and politics. You know, I have a couple of responses. <clears throat> I mean, the first is that you know I think I think a, you know if you look at it, of course, those are the big sort of power sources. But I think if you look at what if you look at the history, I think you can make a really good argument that what tips tip, has tipped the hand, tipped the scale. Uh, in the key moments has been ideology. And that's that's what that's what brought Chavez to power. Chavez came from nowhere. I mean, people knew who he was, but in 1997 he was in the single digits. When he declared he was President Kennedy was in the single digits. And it wasn't really until early 1998 that uh, there were certain circumstances that ever happened. There was an economic decline. But he was able, with his incredible oratory ability, he was able to make sense of that to people. You know, he was able to explain to people uh, correctly or not, it doesn't really matter. He was able to make sense of what people were going through. The fact that they did not have uh, enough to eat, they didn't have everything that they needed to, to, to reproduce themselves. He was able to make sense of that saying that this was because of a conspiring elite that was selling our oil for seven dollars a barrel to the imperial powers. That made sense to people and he said that you know if we take control of our oil and we get enough money for it, you can live well. He, he became president, he actually did that. The, the ideology just really resonated. You know, in the key moments, when he was almost defeated in 2004, um, you know, but he, he pulled that out. It, he was also, he, he put forward some just amazing uh, oratory, um, really political ritual that um, made sense of what was going on. He called it, you know, he, he related to Simon Bolivar being defeated in the Battle of Santa Inez. And he said, I came over to San you know, and then Bolivar looped around and came back to the same town and then defeated. It was brilliant, you know. It was brilliant political fear. He made sense of things for people, and and he defeated the <coughs> Um 
you know, on the other side, and you look at the opposition and how, how sort of, what a difficult, how they've snatched defeat from the jaws of victory time and again. I think it has a, a lot to do with their inability to come forward with an ideology that can make sense of what they want to do. Because what they want to do is basically a bit, pretty sort of logical, soft neoliberal type uh, um, uh, policies, but they, they have no way of really making sense of that, of, of making sense of that in a way that's good, not going to be rejected by the population. So, for example, last year this time, you know, even though inflation was, you know, above it was 60 percent, even though things were very difficult, Chavismo swept the municipal elections across the country. And even though the opposition was portraying them as a referendum on Maduro, they swept them. It, it, a poll sh shortly before those elections showed that 60 percent, more than 60 percent, about two thirds of the population didn't know what the, where the opposition stood on the major issues of the day, which were inflation, uh, um, unemployment, and uh, yeah. scarcities in crime. And so, I mean, that's just, that's amazing if you think about it, that people just have no idea what the opposition is. So, I think that you could, you, could, uh, you know, in typical uh, Michael Mannion fashion, I actually looked up Mannion in Google, it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> in typical Mannion fashion, we start today. Um, you know what? What man would say is that it's not ideological instead of political. It's not ideological instead of economic. It's ideological and political and economic. And I think in this case also, you could say it's, it's military as well, because a big part of, of Chavez's ideological profile is the fact that he's a military man. And Venezuelans love the military. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the public institution with the highest approval rating after the church consistently for this is for decades. Because it has a very a very consistent moral economy having to do with authority and, and, and getting things done. Uh, people really relate to in Venezuela. So I think that all of these you can come, come together. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think. You know, it's just uh, it's a little difficult to come and try and say which is the most, at least in this case. I know that that man says that in certain contexts there's one that's most and more important than the others. I think you can see all of them clearly, but as well as you need to the fact that it has a state oil company, so that brings politics and economics together in a very powerful way. But I think the 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 the, the factor, the variable that is the difference that makes the difference in the past 15 years is ideology. And part of that is the military. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's very easy to collapse the model. That said, I think stepping back and looking at man's first chapter, you know, he, he, uh, he first goes through these four sources, these sources of social power, but he says very clearly that these are ideal types. You know? it, he says that in actual social life, there are power networks that involve more than one, usually more than one, sometimes multiple, sometimes three or four, um, uh, sources of social power. No? The state is one, for example. The, the, the state usually involves politics, economics, and the military. The, um, and so, you know, that's why I think really, uh, you know, the more relevant part is table two, you know, in which I really trace the power networks. Uh, and only a couple of those have just one source of social power. You know, most of them have multiple sources of social power. But you know, if man is man is portraying what he's doing as network theory, you know, as a <coughs> network approach, the key to the network approach to social structures, network metaphor social structure, means that you're looking at concrete relationships. You know, he wants to say that he doesn't want to look at dimensions, he doesn't want to look at levels of society, he wants to look at concrete relationships, and that's a network metaphor. And so I think, you know, in the end, I, I you know, uh, this table one, I, I put that in there, but I kind of I kind of think it's cheating. You know, I kind of think that if the analysis is consistent, it should just be power networks. But then I felt a little, I didn't feel quite as bad because it just, just yesterday I taught man's volume four, and he cheats in the same way again. And so, because he, in the very last chapter of the, of the last volume, he goes back and he looks at the four networks in empirical terms. And so, I, mean, I think that's one of, this is one of the tensions that I said that I have with this approach, that, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm not sure 
if a man is clear on this, I'm certainly not clear on what the status is of these IT types. You know, because he seems to be doing the same thing that Jeff Alexander's strong program of cultural sociology has been criticized for, <coughs> of saying, well, we're going to make this analytic distinction, but then proceeding along and treating it as a cultural, as an actual empirical distinction. You know? And so I think that's what that's what this table kind of does right here. That's what that the man does at the end. But I really think that you know the, the analysis should be, if it's a real network analysis, it should be like table two, just, just power networks that are going to involve more than one type of social power. But but it's 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 still not clear to me, and I'm not sure if it's clear to him what the status is of, of those types. He wants to say they're not dimensions, he wants to say they're not levels. They're not real things. And so exactly what are they? And can they be used in, in empirical analysis? Um, the, uh, just one, one last small little comment. The, um, you know, as far as the uh, revolution, uh, I, I guess I can already address this. I mean, just, just going back and talking about Chavismo as a revolution, it, I, think, I think it's an interesting point Chavez and Chavismo, they referred to what they're doing as a revolution. Of course, it was not a violent takeover of power. It was a democratic takeover of power. But it's revolutionary in the sense that they sought constituent power. You know, they went to a constitutional assembly. And, and that's what I think, you know, it's not a bloody revolution, but it definitely is a, a real change in the major institutions yeah, of the country through constituent power. Any questions? Uh, well, I thought this was a fascinating uh, paper, and since one of our aims is to promote um, interdisciplinary dialogue, I'm going to uh, uh, raise both theoretical and a substantive point from a political science uh, perspective. Um, you uh, structure it theoretically as a defense of this uh, of man's Weberian model against pluralist and Marxist models, and uh, you indicate in the paper that the problem with pluralist models is that they presume the state is most important. Um, I don't think that that is the biggest weakness, nor in your presentation here you cited Lutz. Uh, the, the pluralists are most often criticized for um, uh, not focusing on, it's not that they focus on the state, in fact they tend to minimize state institutions and say uh, that competition amongst various groups uh, really drives politics. Um, uh, but uh, their uh, error is this optimism uh, that there is an equilibrium where every group sooner or later has its day and they all can get their needs taken care of, admittedly, <coughs> partly uh, through the state. And the left critique is that uh, uh, no, groups have highly unequal power and it's not going to work out. Uh, the equilibrium of results is one in which lots of groups um, uh, won't get uh, what they need. Um, and I think that critique has uh, led pluralists to modify their view. Uh, but the uh, analysis that you do put forth uh, actually looks more pluralist to me in the sense that your table two, which as you just indicated, is the real uh, driver of the analysis, it looks to me like a mapping of coalitional politics. I mean, sociologists talk about networks, uh, but when you're talking about those who are on the Chavismo side and those who are on the opposition side, and you're lining them up uh, with their different um, interests and sources of power, but all on one side or the other, you're talking about rival coalitions in the struggle for power, and that looks pretty much like uh, standard pluralistic uh, political science, and you know, groups form into rival coalitions um, uh, to capture the state. And so uh, that doesn't look so different than the positions that you're um, uh, criticizing uh, uh, as a theoretical uh, structure for explaining politics. Um, as far as uh, more substantively, the, the um, uh, in connection with some of Brandy's points, I mean, I very much like the argument uh, that there may not be some single driver of power that um, uh, is most decisive in all times and places. It can be different things at different times. Um, but your paper reads a lot like 
uh, some of the comparative political science literature on petrostates or states that um, uh, rely on uh, well, one commodity as the chief source of wealth. And the standard criticism in that literature is that uh, those states don't provide for long-term economic prosperity because uh, they don't develop diversified economies and they tend to become authoritarian. They operate basically by generating this wealth and buying off uh, people and suppressing the opposition. Uh, and so sooner or later they become authoritarian um, economic failures. And your paper reads like it is pointing toward that kind of story. Um, in your comments just now, though, you said that, well, it isn't actually um, uh, simply that story, and I'm not that crazy about that political science story because it does seem so economically deterministic, and you just said, well, it isn't simply uh, that uh, they buy off um, lots of people with uh, oil money and suppress the rest. Um, uh, that in fact there's this ideological element that is the big source of their uh, appeal and explains why uh, they've done well even when the economy wasn't going uh, so great. Um, uh, I don't think that's the way the paper comes across now and if that is uh, your argument, which I find very interesting, I would encourage you to develop it uh, uh, more explicitly. Um, uh, but I also want to know if indeed that is your argument. Yeah, the, um, and those are uh, really good comments. The, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm not actually a political scientist. So I know, the, that's the interdisciplinary yeah, dialogue. Yeah, the, uh, and so, you know, what pluralist means to me might be a little bit too broad. The, um, you know, I, I uh, am sort of responding, but my, my exposure, Political science comes via my, uh, you know, the work that's being done in Venezuela and other sort of post, post neoliberal and left contexts. And so, you know, in, work, in writing this paper and working through this and working through man and, and, and uh, 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 whatnot, I realized that, you know, what you get uh, from uh, you know, a lot of global science, you know, Kurt Wayland and Michael Coppedge and Javier Morales, it is actually sort of a mixture of, of sort of pluralist but also sort of elite theory, you know. It, it's, it's very much a concern of the state becoming tyrannical, you know. And so, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you look at actual straightforward Dalian pluralism, well, that's what it is. It's not state-centered. It doesn't really seem to believe in the state a whole lot. It just believes in these different social groups uh, and having some sort of system in which they can compete and there's some sort of rotation of, of authority. I think in actual practice in, in Latin American as political science, those things kind of get merged. And so what, what gets looked at is sort of the state and whether the state is democratic enough to allow these um, this alternation of elite groups, and always with the assumption, the, the sort of uh, Gaetano Mosca, Roberto Michel's assumption that the state is going to develop elites that are going to pursue their own interest if they can. You know? And so that, that's kind of the theory that I'm, I'm taking on, and so I realize that it's sort of a, a uh, uh, a composite sketch of a, from my outsider view of, of political science. So I definitely need to sort of finesse that and figure out exactly, you know, who I'm taking on and what I want to say. Because, um, in fact, one of the things I want to do, I mean, I just find that so much, so much of the critical discourse in Venezuela is focused on the state. You know, it's focused on this very valid point that a petro state it's very easy for it to become, you know, overbearing and tyrannical and pursue its own interests instead of the people's interests. But I just think that that ends up sort of uh, occluding all of these other elements of the conflict. And so I, I suppose I could end up rephrasing this and say I'm reinserting the pluralism, pluralism again, sort of a lead state center power, political science. I have to actually work out. No, I, I have a good feeling of what exactly I want to say, but I'm not sure what the actual labels of, 
uh, you know, in, in global science are. You know, the, um, this issue of the petrostate, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that literature has gotten complex with people like um, this guy, uh, Thad Dunning, is that the guy who's at Yale? He's at Berkeley now, who wrote a, a, a really interesting book on Venezuela that arguing against the, you know, the whole, the, uh, the idea um, that petrostates inevitably reduce uh, democracy and economic development, saying that Venezuela, well, actually, you can see how it actually contributed to it. And so I think that whole, that whole literature has really opened up, and that's kind of the way I see it. I mean, I think, you know, it, uh, you know, uh, the petrostate is the 800 pound gorilla in the room in any discussion of Venezuela. But I definitely think that there's no, there's no reason that it has to lead to a certain authoritarianism. You know, it, there's no reason it has to lead to economic uh, debacle that I think it's doing right now. I think that it has a lot to do with with ideology. I think it has a lot to do, and so I feel like I need to develop this more. If you just look at the type of left that appeared in Venezuela, it's historical. You know, you, you compare it to the Southern Cone left, where all these left leftist movements had to spend a couple of decades under uh, dictatorial context. They were marginalized through dictatorship, so they very much valued civil liberties in, in gaining any kind of democratic spaces that they could, and they still value those things. The, the Venezuelan left was marginalized in democracy, you know. Uh, Romulo Betancourt prohibited, you know, outlawed the Communist Party. They were, you know, they were killed, they were marginalized. They, they had a failed guerrilla movement. They very much had developed over a few decades the whole idea of that democracy, democratic institutions were a sham. It, and, and so that had brought, you know, the it, within Chavismo there was a very there, there was there is a very strong anti-institutional element that doesn't believe in transparency that doesn't believe in checks and balances that doesn't believe uh, you know in institutional solidity of any kind it's considered bourgeois, you know, and so I think that has has uh, that explains a lot of the economic debacle failure. Uh, I think a lot of that is, is ideological. And so I definitely, you know, Petro, Petro State is huge, but I, I think it's so open and open-ended now and, and what we understand about it that but I definitely need to, to, to refine that. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I think that the Post-liberal democracy. What does it mean, post-liberal democracy? 
So, you know, on the one hand, one could think about uh, the rights of the indigenous movement, uh, the collective rights, the idea that, you know, it's, it's not about individual, civic, and political rights, but collective rights, the issue of social justice, uh, redistribution, um, <coughs> perhaps you want to tag in human rights, you mentioned that before as part of what the your appendix, I'm not sure if you do or not, but, but you know, it, it, Kind of a very different theoretical conception of what could be post liberal democracy that sort of runs along those those uh, those histories of, of social mobilization and perhaps you know some some sort of coherent body of thought. I'm not sure. Or it could be that you know post liberal democracy is something more like democracy institutions, democratic institutions are a sham. Like, you know, the, the anarchist view that is emerging in, in the most radical sectors of the left in Latin America. If you think about the protest in Brazil in 2013, you know, there, there are clearly anti-institutionalist groups, the Movimento Passe Livre, which, which has spearheaded the, the, the protests, you know, are anarchists against the state. So what is post-liberal democracy and how are we going to anchor it in, in, in rights of whatever type or institutions or whatever it could be? Right. Um, it's interesting, you know, I, I if you go to Arditi's uh, uh, piece that was in Laar and then, and then in the uh, Edge by by Cameron and Hirschberg, the, you know, it, what he, he post-liberal is to liberal what post-structuralism is to structuralism. You know, it, it's, a, it's a new form of liberalism. It's not after liberalism. See, that's the way he portrayed it, and that's what I would agree with. I, it's not anti-liberalism. You no, know, it's, uh, uh, and so the way I see it, what I see happening in Venezuela and other new left contexts is it's an amplification of rights. You know? And it's important to remember uh, you know, that because if you just listen to some of some of the rhetoric, you can fish for rhetoric in Venezuela that will make it sound just straightforward Leninist. It will just make it sound like the only thing you're interested in are economic and cultural and social rights, and that that uh, you know civil and political rights are are absolute passe. But it's but it's, it's actually it's not true. If you if you look at the 1990 Constitution, it has a full gamut you know, of civil and political rights. It's interesting just in 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 July, I was with a couple of groups, a couple of human rights groups that were all from the southern of Mexico and the southern Cone that came to Venezuela, and they wanted to see the situation from the, for themselves, from Argentina, Brazil, and one from Mexico. And, and uh, so we had different meetings with different NGOs and, and with the government. And so I, I thought the government, you know, we met with about three or four different instances of the government that had to do with human rights, and I thought for sure they were going to trot out, it's like, oh, that they're, they're this new level, a new dimension of human rights, that they've forgotten bourgeois rights. Um, but none of them said anything like that. In fact, we went to the Attorney General's uh, office, and of course they give you all kinds of different propaganda and magazines. And, and so I opened up, you know, this, it, it, there's a big glossy magazine called Human Rights, the Attorney General herself gave it to us. And I opened it up, and there's a, a foreword to the whole issue, you know, which she, she apparently wrote. And it, it starts by talking about saying human rights as a concept started with John Locke. It starts talking about John Locke. And then, she, and then it talks about, and then there's the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. And that was the first column, and I thought, okay, this is going to go straight into Marx on the Jewish question and saying, you know, that this is bourgeois and passé. But it, it, it wasn't there. It was just, <laughs> It was just Locke and the French Revolution. I couldn't believe it. No, she's straight, straight. It's right there. And so, and that's what we heard time and again from from all three, four. We talked to the you know, the ombudsman, attorney general, the the um, you know the the, the uh, ministry of exterior, their department of human rights, and the new vice presidential commission on human rights, and all of them. Focus on civil and political rights, 
Basically, their argument was that they were being misunderstood, they were being misrepresented, that the record was much better than the people thought, etc. But none of them said, oh, we're in this new phase and we're focusing on social, economic, and cultural rights. The, uh, and so in that sense, I think that Arditi is right on the money. It's not anti-liberal, it's post-liberal. It's adding rights to liberalism. Now, I think this is a very difficult uh, situation, a very difficult position, because of course, the more rights you have here, um, the more difficult it is to balance them. You know? How do you balance people's economic rights, uh, or you, their, their rights to you know, basic economic level subsistence with the rights to ownership? You know? How do you balance their rights to cultural identity with the freedom of expression? You know, when newspapers don't represent. Can you force newspapers to cover indigenous issues? No, without violating freedom of expression. I mean, there's, there's really, you have all these rights to try and balance them. It can be very difficult. And so I think, in actual point of fact, I think many of these left governments do violate quite a few civil and political rights. I mean, the Venezuelan government, it absolutely, is it, really violating a lot of the rights to, to expression. And you, you can go further, you know, and, and of course there's the argument that, that many have made, the French Fukuyama and, and others, you know, that the more rights you have, the more sort of social, economic, and cultural rights you have, the more likely it is you're going to end up with uh, a strong state that's sort of dictatorial because <coughs> to try and push forward all these rights, you have to have a big, strong state. And so, I mean, I think there's all kinds of tensions in there. So I don't want to just paint a rosy picture and say, oh, things have these great post-liberalism. It just means there's more rights. I think there's some real tensions uh, between these rights, and I think that they're, uh, you know, I think there's undeniably been in Venezuela a real deterioration in terms of civil and political rights. There's been some gains, but there's been a lot more losses just in terms of civil and political rights. Of course, I think there's been some gains in, in economic, social, and cultural rights that are undeniable as well. I have a couple of comments. Um, I was sort of surprised that, you know, the very respect there's nothing on charisma, and, uh, and especially about Chavez, whom I miss, by the way, because I think he was a colorful character. And, uh, and, and you mentioned that the whole thing seems to be, uh, you know, collapsing now after without Chavez. And we know in, in, in other contexts so, of um, these leftist governments or these leftist movements, they, they have a tendency to be personalistic and, and uh, so they have a problem of succession. Who's going to, they face in Argentina, they face in Brazil, they face in Ecuador. And uh, so, uh, how do you see that from being a minister? How much uh, uh, is, it, is it a fate of these leftist governments to have to be personalistic? Can they institutionalize? Can they? Is there room for that, or, or, or is something that uh, they always have to produce new leaders, popular leaders? And the other thing that, that you know, it builds on um, Roger's comments, and and, um, and uh, I actually find it interesting the, the, the tendency to polarize in this, which is again, it's not just Venezuela. It's, it's uh, it, the, you know, the same is the, the front enemy sort of dynamic of the politics in the region, uh, you see in Argentina, Ecuador, and, and, uh, and uh, so your, type, your typology, which I, I, I find your paper and the analysis in fascinating, it's very interesting because I really think that the paying attention to the opposition in the discussion is actually very interesting because it's uh, really, the, there is something going on with the opposition that does, and, uh, but the tendency to polarize and your, your, your capacity to just separate <coughs> between Chavismo and opposition, to what extent that came from the beginning, or that's an outcome after political struggles, uh, uh, divisions, and, and so forth. Is, is, is there really nothing in the middle that, you know, that actors can, you know, try to recruit for their political position? Uh, I always find it interesting that the, of the, the democratic opposition in Latin America is willing to undermine democracy, to defend democracy. <laughs> So I wonder to what extent this is the product that the middle disappearing. Do they do, do they do they feel that they can never win an election? And uh, um, how how does that play out? Right. Okay. 
The, um, the first the, the issue of charisma. Uh, you know, I, you're right. I don't mention that. And the thing is, I think uh, it's something that's, that that was really significantly overplayed in understanding of charisma. And um, you know, I I'm one that I think that Weber on charisma is is largely misunderstood as well. I think most people understood and understand charisma as being a characteristic of the individual that sort of just overwhelms the the, the, the receiver. If you look at if you look at and the thing is Weber sort of brought that on himself. You read the Economy and Society and his passages on and his, his sections on charisma. If you look at his actual empirical study, if you look at for example ancient Judaism, which he which is, is probably the place where he most uh, carefully works through a charismatic episode, he there he, he really looks and pays a lot of attention to the context and looks at what are the conditions that make charisma plausible in this context and what was the actual content of what we call charisma. You know, and, and, and looks at uh, you know uh, how the prophets were able to, to gain charisma. I think you know in in, in Venezuela Clearly, Chavez was somebody that had a great, had great oratory capacity, you know, and he uh, uh, really, you know, people still just really think of him as almost like a savior figure. The thing is, if you look at, if you look at what brought that on, you know, and, and this especially happened when he died, it, it, the, the media either portrayed it as being utilitarian, that people had a very utilitarian relationship with or that they had this emotional religious uh, relationship. And I think th this is continuous with my actual work on religion and religious conversion. One of the things, if you think of the, the title of my book, Reason to Believe, I try to portray a religious conversion as something that actually was quite rational and has it in, and worked through a rational process, although through a, a different cultural logic than most of the people who analyze religion think with. And so, in the same way, I, I wrote a couple pieces after Chavez died, or right around that period, you know, saying that we need to think about people's devotion to Chavez in terms of emotional rationality and rational emotions. You know, taking off from John Elster. The, uh, it, you know, if, if you think about, if you are a person who lives on the margins, doesn't have, you know, doesn't necessarily think that you're always going to have enough to eat, that you're going to be able to feed and clothe your kids and, and educate them, and someone comes along and promises that they can do this if you if you elect them, and they actually end up doing it. Well, that is something that can generate a lot of emotion. You know, if you just it, there's there's no contradiction between emotion and rationale. If you just think about, for example, uh, you know, my daughters are at the age of soon they're going to be applying for universities, and they've worked, and they've worked, and they've worked really hard, and rationally calculated their, their, their schedules, and classes are going to take this and that. And I know when they get the letter from that school that they want to go to that says, yes, they're going to break down crying. Or if it says, no, they're going to break down crying. It's going to be a very emotional moment, even though it's absolutely rational. You know? and, and, and so uh, I think these emotions can be very rational. I think people having a devotion to Chavez was actually quite rational. Um, now, I don't really have an answer for you on your second part of that question, or whether, whether you can have, you know, in Latin America, it seems so often that you have these leftist populist leaders that and people end up having this, this, you know, this overwhelming sort of uh, devotion to is that necessary? I don't know. I mean, I, that's a good question. You know, I think if you, if you, if you compare Lula to Chavez, I don't think Lula has quite that problem with Chavez. I, I, I'm not sure. But, you know, I, I do think, I think Chavez was a megalomaniac. I think that he did a lot of things precisely to, to make himself into that the person, so I think there, there was a certain sort of ideological charge and personality that he really wanted to try and accentuate that, you know, uh, and of course, any time that you have con that much concentration of power, you know, you end up, uh, uh, you know, developing this cult of personality that comes from the concentration of power, not the other way around. I mean, you know, Stalin, Stalin had to be one of the most unattractive figures of the 20th century. He ended up with cities named after him, and, and 
the statues all over the place because he had so much power that he became someone that was, uh, uh, you know, in the people uh, power personally. Um, the second issue is polarization one. This is, this is, I think, one of the most interesting issues in, in Venezuela. This is my whole paper is very much sort of a response. It, my whole getting into this game of writing about politics is, is sort of a response to this issue of polarization because so much of what's written on Venezuela is polarized and being in Venezuela is just it's amazing. People will say, you know, one of the first things you say about somebody is, is he Chavista or is it Esquadio? And so, and, and, and you want to know that. You go to someone's house, someone's house and you ask them, you know, someone that doesn't have Chavista is funny. But because you just want to, you, you want to know because it, it's so relevant for almost everything. What's interesting, you know, I think, I think, you know, if you just think about what's going on in all of the, what, what the Chavez government has done. Basically, everything was fine for the first couple of years when Chavez was just trying to deepen democracy. When they were rewriting the Constitution and trying to bring in civil society and trying to bring in more people to the government, everything was fine. You know, it, things didn't really start falling apart until, the, you know, the end of 2001, or really 2002, when, and then in 2001, when Chavez put through the 50, decreed 50 new laws, the economic laws, that it, it changed, it made extensive changes in land tenure, in, in fishing rights, in the hydrocarbon regime. You know, all of these things touched on basic interest, and that's when things started really coming apart. 2002, there's a coup. 2002, 2003, there's a general strike. There's a push for recall. That's where the polarization came. So in classic Marxist fashion, I think you can get a long way just saying, well, once people's real interests, once people's economic interests were touched, once Chavez started to try and extend democracy and not just deepen democracy, well, then, you know, uh, things started to really fall apart. You started polarizing. But going beyond that, it's very clear that Chavez had as a political strategy polarization, you know, because if he could... If he could polarize on class, he had the numbers to win. And he had on his side the fact that the opposition always believed they're in the majority. They always believed because of the fact that most of the opposition, everyone they know, hated Chavez. And so they always thought that they were in the majority. And so Chavez would do things to polarize, and they would gleefully uh, take that on. Know, and participate in the polarization because they were convinced they were the truth. And so, uh, you know, but it, consistently Chavez won 55 to 60 percent uh, of the vote using this strategy. The, the most, the clearest case was when he went up for when they tried the second time to change, to try to change the constitution, and he was down. You know, uh, in December 2008, he was down. You know, 45 percent to 55 percent. He ended up winning uh, six weeks later, 55 to 45 percent. And how did he do that? He did that by polarizing, by creating all kinds of conflicts, pushing through some really controversial reforms, and getting everybody to think, do I stand with Chavez or am I against, with, against Chavez? And so a lot of the people that are in the middle, foot dragging Chavez, just think, oh, you know, uh, uh, I've got to support this guy. And so it's, I think it's just the nature of the change of process, or the, pro the process of change, uh, or the, the types of changes that the Chavez government has done. But I also think it was a very good and political strategy. Um, uh, I think he was like, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for for your uh, talk for your paper. Um, I'm not a specialist on Latin America, but um, I have been working on the communication style of shamans, and it seems to me something very unusual and uh, in a certain way is brilliant doing that. So you already made a lot of types of media. You change completely the way he is addressing the public. So he's not addressing like the president, he's addressing like someone who you know from the street. And he, should he also reported all the media, media in international context. Like I, I was talking with Dilma and then come uh, Michelle or someone else. And well, talking like I'm explaining to you what we are doing here in community. So in this sense, seems to me a very powerful strategy. Um, but he also uses 
a lot of religions element and also Catholicism in that, and use it to capitalize on himself. Transfer it also if you do, if you look at the way he is using, he was using the Catholicism, where basically transferring the power of God to him as a representative, a representative of the people. And he also used a direct identification from the, with the people with him as a person, not as a representative. So all these characteristics that I mentioned after, so using the power of God and motivating identification with himself as a person identification, doesn't seem to me very helpful to construct a kind of uh, democratic uh, discourse. So it's, it's a kind of, of queer cut between the one side polarizing on the class issue, but also even in the audience, the feeling that you are citizen, talking to you like someone from the street to explain you, but in the same way, putting themselves a kind of fan from God, uh, being what you want to be. And, and was, as he died, the people were carrying uh, or wearing t-shirts uh, with, a, with a slogan, Seattle's Chavez. So that's a completely inversion of representation. We, are, we have to be the leader, not the leader have to reflect on it. So I, I would like to, to ask you, how do you see that? That's the first question, because a lot of people will interpret that as a totalitarian style of communication. And the second uh, question, comparing to with Brazil, um, I was very surprised going to <coughs> of months ago and finding a situation that I never had seen before, uh, I spent 10 years not going to Brazil, when you have a kind of uh, economic integration from the classes um, C and D, not the class E, what you have in Latin America, but C and D e by class C, which is probably what you're also explaining, like people who are able to buy refrigerator, so they are voting for this part. But we're clearly seeing in Brazil that um, in a completely different way, um, it's not polarizing anymore. It's integrating so much that you don't you don't have this kind of class issue anymore. So how do you compare both and do you think that could be something that could happen in Venezuela if you continue to integrate uh, classes like C and D and perhaps also E? In the, in the economic system, that one day we will not have this power for polarization ideological feature anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it, just to take those in reverse order. That last, that last question, I think, is, is kind of a hard one. The, uh, you know, I think in Venezuela, polarization. Has, uh, it, I, as I mentioned, I think it's, it's the most salient aspect of the public sphere. But I don't think it's necessarily a strong or a, a good representation of the society. I think most people aren't all that polarized. I think it's gotten less so. It takes more work for Chavismo to try and polarize. Um, and I think the opposition, at least some sectors of the opposition, you know, don't, don't do it anymore. You know, I, and, and I think, but it's not so much that people have grown out of it. I don't necessarily think that class, class, uh, you know, uh, class divisions have decreased. I mean, they have decreased, but I don't think that's the reason that polarization has really decreased. It's not like there used to be Chavistas that now are middle class and that they no longer are that way. It's, I think the, the, the polarization that exists is basically people that have a real connection to the state, either work in the state or very good benefits or have someone that works in the state, versus those who are really directly jeopardized or have their livelihood, their well-being threatened by the state. Those are the points of polarization. Most people are sort of in between. And you know, right now, most people are really sort of dealing with sort of some real economic difficulties. You know? uh, the economy is, is really poor. So right now there's just so much data flux that I don't see, you know, it's hard to imagine any kind of slow growth on polarization. You know, I, it, you know, I, I think, you know, my view that the, the opposition 
could actually win. You know, with, I think they, they could have won elections previously if they, if they if they resisted polarization, but actually had a message. And Enrique Capriles in 2012, it was part of his policy as a presidential candidate to not polarize, and he wouldn't respond to Chavez's sort of provocation because he didn't want to polarize. He knew he knew the score, they knew the numbers, and and uh, but the part he didn't catch on is that he actually had to have a message which he didn't. And so that's that's the second part. They have to have a message. They, if they polarize, they're going to lose. But if you don't polarize, you still need to say something. You know? um, as far as the other the other issue, yeah, absolutely. The communicational style of Chavez, the idea I think in terms of ideology, is is actually is, is polarized in many dimensions. And I wrote a piece that's on the Imminent Frame blog, the SSRC Religion blog. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what the name of it was, but it's something along the lines of uh, you know Venezuela's axial age, in which what I what I argued was that you know Chavez is part of you know something that you see across the region really, but it's more accentuated in Venezuela, is that no longer are people sort of content with this sort of ideology of of you know pragmatic state-led development. The, the stronger ideologies seem to be carrying the day. You look at Chavez's speeches, you know, he brings in evangelical metaphors, progressive Catholicism, he brings in metaphors from women's movements, from Afro-Venezuelan movements, from pan-indigenous movements, from nationalists, from neo-fascists, from anything it is it's this huge bricolage of different ideological elements that brings him a lot of derision from people, but it resonates with a lot of people. And, and he saw it, and a lot of people saw it, all of these things were sort of responses to the 1990s technocratic lack of ideology. And he came along with a very ideological message. And ideology, of course, polarizes the world. It, it, it divides the world into safe and profane, into good and bad, and it has an incredible mobilizing capacity. You know, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, one of the things where Chavez was able to do what he did is he, he was absolutely able to mobilize people. But of course, it has another side to it, though, and, and, and that is, is it really de democratic, you know? It, it does not never lead to totalitarianism. You know, I think if you look at the very foundations of what liberal democracy is, it's, it's based on this idea that there is no one truth. There is no, it, you know, you're what people are you're supposed to respect freedom of religion, freedom of expression. Why? Well, because we have gotten to the point, or human society got to the point where we think that there's no clear religious truth, there's no clear political truth, and so you have to respect people's opinions. Uh, you know, a lot of what a lot of ideologies don't respect that. Evangelicals often, evangelical uh, fundamentalism would respect that. Socialism uh, would uh, respect that. There's an idea that there is a truth, you know, and so. I, I, I think there's a tension there, absolutely. You know? I, I do think that it can be um, over overestimated because oftentimes these are you know things that Charles says, things he communicates, these are locutions that, that have a purpose. They're acts. He's trying to do something with them. They're not necessarily reflections of something that's in his head or reflections of a new structure of society that's therefore going to Limit. He would, he would, you know, he's somebody that would come up sometimes with these Leninist statements about, you know, liberal democracy being a sham, and then in his next media op would start talking about the need to conserve, you know, civil rights and everybody having a say, you know, or religious freedoms. And so there's, a, there's a lot of contradictions. I think a lot of these communications you have to look at them as acts that, taken by themselves, they can look like they're totalitarian and contradict, but. If, if you realize that, that they're just acts, well, you know, uh, it, it, they're, 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 a little bit, they're a little bit more like objects that, that uh, have their potency, have their power, but don't necessarily, aren't the microcosm of the macro. Go ahead, you have a question? Mm -hmm. No. There's a comment myself. Uh, yes. So you mentioned a lot of the position groups and networks in your and I was curious as to whether there was boundary deactivation at some point, and if not, why didn't that happen? Like, why uh, different opposition groups, um, I mean, experiencing state oppression together, 
um, could just develop some sense of solidarity. Maybe you know unite forces under some you know anti conflict in the sense of blocked off use them and you know mobilize forces and against against the government. Yeah, I mean I think uh, I'm not sure if I if, 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 just let me know if I don't fully answer your question. The uh, you know the opposition has actually mobilized, has unified. Um, you know, and I think uh, at different moments they, they've done some pretty credible things. And so, um, you know, I just, you, you look at the context, you look at, uh, and it's been a pretty tough road to hoe for them in the sense that, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a petro state, it's an oil state, and they have this, the government has this huge budget that they, you know, without clear institutions or without clear beliefs in separation of powers and, and separation of, of people, party, government, and state, they use state resources for, you know, political purposes. And so it, it's, it's been quite tough, you know, uh, for the opposition. It's an adverse context. I mean, that said, I think the opposition, you know, is very divided, you know, the, the, I mean, there, there's, there's any number of problems. One of them is that they're very divided. You know, even now, I mean, the, you know, Chavismo just last week or two weeks ago had primaries to select their candidates uh, for the legislative elections that are coming up. The opposition hasn't even looked, they haven't discussed their primaries, how they're going to have primaries, because there's so much conflict within and, 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 and uh, sort of distrust between them. Uh, that it's really hard for them to come together in a strategy. Now, one other thing is that, uh, you know, with the opposition, you know, the opposition, its major figures and its sort of, its discourses and ways of thinking and interacting with each other still comes from the Fourth Republic, it comes from the pre chavez era, in which Venezuela had a very much, uh, uh, you know, a pacted government that was, the government was very distant from the people, basically. People, you know, could vote once every five years for a party that had a presidential candidate. The president would name, uh, you know, the, the mayors and the, go and the, the governors, and, and it was the party they controlled. And of course, some of that changed in the 1990s, but there's this long-term tendency in the opposition to just negotiate amongst themselves, you know, and they just don't have to do, they don't think they have to do campaigning and go out and talk to the people and understand the people and, and, and find the people where they're at, which is where the communication thing comes in. Mean, this is what Chavez brought to Venezuelan you know, politics, is actual communication to and from with people. The opposition still doesn't get that message. You know, they still don't uh, uh, see that, I, I mean, that's a little bit too broad. They, there are some parts of the younger folks in the opposition that do get that, you know, but it's a little bit more complex. There are also people that are more radical, like the Bola Lopez. The Bola Lopez is somebody that actually has done the footwork. Uh, and there are some, some newer people, but in the long term, that is one of the, one of the biggest problems I see with the opposition. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I have a, a question. It's, uh, you have shown that there are gains and losers in this story, and there are also winners and losers. Uh, and that's mainly how I understand you able to. Uh, but the dark side of the commodity boom uh, and the oil exploitation, not just in Venezuela, is this soci social environmental problems. And like one month ago in the same room, we were talking about the commodity boom, like the dark side and the consequences uh, for indigenous population, for example. So my question is, uh, what has Chavism meant for indigenous populations? What have been the impact, and how would you map the role of indigenous populations thinking on the roadmap that you are providing, maybe even on the table to the principal? Like, okay. Is it the same? The impact on indigenous, indigenous populations, or on the for both? Indigenous populations. Uh -huh. Well, that, that's, that's a really interesting question. I think that the, it's a really mixed bag. The, um, you know, the indigenous population, I, I, have a, I have a chapter of this book uh, 
that basically looks at, and I've never quite got the, the, the right term for it, but it looks at sort of resistant identities that have not been able to be incorporated in child people. And so I look at indigenous issues, I look at anti-Semitism, and I look at labor. So these are all groups that were constituted before Chavismo that have presented real problems for Chavismo in, in their efforts to try and, and somehow incorporate them. The, um, you know, Venezuela has it passed one of the most progressive indigenous laws in, in the region, in the world, really. 2006 uh, law on indigenous peoples uh, basically says that if, you know, indigenous groups, if they can come put together historical studies and show that they, you know, that, that they have a right to a certain land, they can put together, you know, uh, a claim for a homeland, you know, and, and, and say, well, this land is ours. And of course, you know, uh, in, indigenous populations are, are pretty, pretty smooth operators in, in Venezuela as anywhere in the world. And so they, they have put together, for example, the, the Yucaba in Western Venezuela put together a very plausible study showing that they should have a homeland in Western Sulia in the lowlands. Right now they're up in the mountains, but they, they can show they can show that they were pushed up in the mountains and they actually that, that land should belong to them. And they've done everything. They they the anthropologists, historians, you know, they've done everything they have to. But of course, this land is in between Colombia and the Lake of Maracaibo, which is a major port. It has coal underneath it, it has oil underneath it, and it has cattle grazing on top of it. it, it it's, it's some of the most valuable land in Venezuela. And so, what has the government done? Well, it's, it's, it's basically sort of pushed and shoved, it's divided communities, it's given plots of land. You know, the whole idea of the homeland is that you get this big contiguous uh, space, you know, but they started to give certain communities spot and pop, uh, parts of land, they divided communities, and so, you know, it, it's been pretty ugly in actual practice. You know, but, but there's activists within the government that are trying to fight for the homeland, so it, it's not at all clear, you know, um, what's going on. But there's, you know, in the same area, any number of in, indigenous uh, leaders have been uh, killed, you know, not by the government, but by local, you know, because you have the ranchers there, they're in, in cahoots with the local police, you know, and, and to try and, you know, uh, uh, push off or kill off indigenous leaders, and then the indigenous leaders try to get the government to to protect them, and so it, it's a huge mess. I mean, the law itself is is a very progressive, provides around for some really interesting uh, changes. And there have been some, some cases in which the indigenous people have gotten a homeland. But in actual practice, of course, it's a you know it's a developmentalist state and they don't want they don't want to get they don't want to hand over this land that has all this coal and oil and, and cattle potential and port potential and you know right next to Colombia. They don't want to hand this over. And so uh, of course there's people within the government that resist that there's other that are fighting, like any state is very complex. Um, you know, so and at one point, when I first drafted this campaign, I was very critical because it looked very bad. The government was really reneging on its, on its, uh, its, its promises to these indigenous peoples. Um, you know, now I have to tone, tone it back a little bit because I think they, you know, uh, they, they made some changes that have given them some more land. But it, it's very complex. Can I, can I add the Afro-Venezuelan population and the indigenous Afro? Yeah, yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the things, you know, the government has done a lot in terms of, like, Ministry of Culture and, and uh, Afro and as well population. Of course, this is, you know, part of third worldism is, is emphasizing the you know, African population, the indigenous population, their importance in, in, as part of the, the, the national, uh, national pride and national history. And so they've done quite a few things. You know, in Venezuela, the Afro populations are not sort of as bounded and coherent and discrete as the indigenous populations. So there's not really the same kind of pressure groups or the same kind of claims for land or resources. You know, but it's definitely been part of, of their of their whole uh, idea of you know, the, the, the negro Felipe in, in, in Western Venezuela. 
I think it's now on a bill or something. So I don't know how money. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's been part, but it hasn't been a big issue. There's no special law, for example. You heard I just have a question actually, which relates to the previous one. Uh, the story that you tell in your paper seems to suggest that one of the driving factors behind the network formation in Venezuela is the presence of a single key. The presence of a single key. The overarching importance of a single key is cloud. Uh -huh. uh, and here's the story that you are telling about the indigenous communities and about the church, seems to suggest that other key images sort of get mapped on to class key images. So then in terms of your theoretical uh, model, uh, the work that the creation of that or the mechanism which is actually driving the formation of a ideological network seems to be not so much uh, it, it's, its control over symbolic power or communication, but the creation of a single overarching identity, an identity which is based upon one key in the society. So you could think of situations where this sort of phenomenon of ideological power in terms of there exists multiple cross-cutting or reinforcing uh, In that sort of situation, how do you see then the sort of network analysis of the creation or maintenance of power playing out? What would happen if there is a multiple conflicting identity? What would happen if there is what? Multiple conflicting identity. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think that's kind of what this is about. I think. Uh, you know, if you take any context, there are, there are all kinds of multiple conflicting identities. And what Chavismo is about is, I mean, it's really, you know, as I say here, the, the, the ideology is not that novel. I think it's, it's basically the third world, which, which is, which is uh, you know, which is, which is a form of a sort of Leninism, you know, emphasizing things like uh, liberation from imperial powers, national development, uh, emphasizing things like our indigenous past and our Afro, our Afro character. And so, you know, that said, within this sort of Chavista, Tercer Mundismo, it, it is a process of, you know, of prioritizing class. You know, Chavez from 2005 on really adopted a socialist uh, uh, perspective, you know, a, a Marxist discourse, which ends up boiling things down to class. And so I think, you know, one of the reasons that he's had difficulty with, or Shaikhul has had difficulty with indigenous populations, is that it doesn't work very well. You know, it, of trying to trying to say, well, the indigenous are actually just peasants. I mean, that's that's what organizers did back in the sixties. 70s, you know, and, and, and so I think they've really resisted that, and, you know, for example, Chavismo, uh, the government will say things like, you know, we're all indigenous, you know, we are, our, we, you know, these are our ancestors, you know, our indigenous past, and, you know, indigenous people would be just like, indigenous, indigenous, you know, indigenous. No, you guys are you guys are the conquistadores, you know. And, and so the, the, the indigenous populations have been dealing with this for centuries, you know, of how to get things from the state but maintain their autonomy, and then the same approach to childhood. So it, that's why in this in this chapter, you know, uh, uh, I, I look at indigenous, I look at the labor movement, paradoxically has been one of the most resistant, and I look at anti-Semitism. Jewish populations, because those are all populations that had a clear identity beforehand that has not been able to be subsumed uh, with this. And so I, I, I'm not saying that Venezuela is a unidimensional cleavage. I'm saying that part of Chavismo is to try and create that against its discourse. And it's been able to do that in some places easier than others. And uh, there's some parts that are just outright completely resistant. So, on that note, I think this is a perfect timing. Thanks. Thank you.